Redattore, eh. prego. Ho fatto partire la registrazione. Ah, ok, ok. Dunque, il primo relatore del panel sarà Patrick Pletscott dell'Institute of National Remembrance di Varsavia con una relazione intitolata Guerra Fredda, relazioni cordiali, alcune osservazioni sulla comunità intellettuale tra gli storici polacchi e la scuola delle annali fra il 1956 e il 1989. Of course, uh, uh, you can present in English. <laughs> so, please, uh, you have the, the, the floor, please. <laughs> Patrick. Hey, thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, good afternoon. It's nice to be with uh, you here. I'm honored to be part of this uh, of this conference, of this uh, panel. Uh, I got just 15 minutes, so I will just go to my, uh, my paper. Well, uh, I decided to focus just on uh, some, uh, some issues. Uh, you can find more details in my draft paper. Well, I have to work on it a little bit more. I've just read it and I found uh, a few mistakes and uh, some linguistics problems, but I will work on it. But well, um, let me say that I will now omit uh, the whole problematic, the whole issue of the uh, characteristics of the singularity, of this exceptionality of Polish and uh, French historians' uh, relations in the communist period from 56, let's say, to the 80s. Uh, I will try to focus myself just on the, um, let's say, origins, the um, reasons, causes of this singularity. Uh, let me say just that uh, from 56 to the late 80s, each year, dozens of dozens of dozens of Polish historians, not only historians, but mainly historians, uh, traveled to the Paris uh, to use the scholarship uh, attributed by Fernand Brodel and uh, his sixième section they call the pratique d'étude on um, France in France. Uh, so uh, there was uh, even a saying that uh, in Paris you got Polish and uh, Italian mafia uh, because the Polish and Italians were very visible uh, guests of Brodel's schools and there are many, many scholars uh, from, from, uh, from there. There are also interpersonal relations between, for, for example, Fernand Brodel and Tadeusz Manteuffel, who was the director of the Historic uh, Institute, Institute uh, in Polish Academies of Science. Jacques Legoff was traveling to Poland so often that he uh, met his wife there. Um, even so, uh, there were also interpersonal intellectual relations. Uh, but as I, uh, this, uh, as I have said, I will focus myself on the reasons, the causes of this intellectual community, which, uh, which occurred uh, despite the existence of Iron Curtain uh, between some French uh, historians uh, linked to the Annal School and some Polish uh, Polish uh, uh, historians. Not 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 all, of course. So let me start with this uh, thing that uh, the most prominent Polish historians, which were very active in the communist period, started their uh, education in the pre-war uh, period, and they were part of the intellectual elite. And this elite, Polish elites pre-war elites were uh, very French oriented. Yes, the French was the, the first language of the elites uh, uh, after, after, after Polish. Uh, so we got a really big, uh, big uh, uh, French culture, cultural existence uh, in uh, the pre-war Poland among the elites. Uh, so these uh, uh, Polish historians just knew French. They were able to communicate with uh, with the French uh, French colleagues. Well, I'm just uh, using some points. I'm just giving you some very general uh, general uh, points, uh, and I will focus myself on the impact of '56 uh, later. Uh, so it's a very interesting thing that, as you know very well, in 1929, um, uh, Mark Bloch and uh, Lucien Feb uh, created the Annal uh, periodical. Yeah. Uh, in 19, uh, 1929, which focused on this uh, uh, economic and social history, non-classical uh, history with opposition to the academic world, which existed also on the peripheries of the um, academic world. But it's very interesting that in, that in Poland in 1931, so just two, two, two years later, uh, another duet of historians, uh, Franciszek Bujak and, um, uh, and Jan Ludkowski created uh, also, Annal uh, periodical. It was called 
In Polish it's Roczniki Badań Dziejów Gospodarczych i Społecznych and it's translated as the Annal of the Economic and Social Science History. So the, even the name is, is very, very similar. We know that this duets of historians, Bloch, Fevre, Rutkowski, Bujak know each other. There are reviews of Polish, of Bujak's, for example, book in Annal, uh, in French annal uh, periodical, uh, bro uh, not Brodel, uh, Bloch visited Poland in uh, Warsaw in 1933 uh, when there was an uh, international historical uh, hist congress of history, of, of historians. Uh, so we see some similarities in the evolution, intellectual evolution of the uh, historiography in Poland and in France during the uh, pre war um, uh, period. And both uh, Bloch and Fev and Bujak and Rutkowski existed somehow on the peripheries. They were uh, underdogs. Yes, uh, they they were in opposition to the academic history. So this this clash, uh, um, their intellectual positions in the academic world, Polish, French, like respectively, is quite similar. Uh, so we just see uh, the creation or the you know, similarities of intellectual paths, yeah, um, uh, um, evolution in France in, uh, and in Poland in the field of non-classical uh, historiography. We know also that many um, prominent historians, Polish historians later, uh, which developed the most uh, strong uh, relations with uh, Brodel and uh, Annal School, did travel to France uh, in the pre-war uh, period or just after 45 when the Stalinism was still uh, in the future. So there were also uh, the, the origins, we can see the origins of interpersonal relations before before 56, before uh, this emergence of, uh, uh, of the singularity of the contacts. So the pre-war contacts. Uh, I won't argue very much the cultural phenomenon as, as uh, the, the similar wartime experience, but we can track prosopography from the prosopographic point of view, the really similar paths of some historians during the war period. And uh, well, the symbol of this similarity is the fact that uh, Fernand Brodel and Witold Kula, the very, very prominent historian, uh, met each other in 44 in the prisoner of war camp in Lübeck. Uh, in uh, Germany. So it's the, uh, also a symbol of this uh, parallel uh, biographies during the war, uh, war time. Uh, and well, it was easier for French and Poles to share the wartime experience uh, than, for example, from uh, uh, for the Polish historians and the German ones, yes, or, or even uh, British uh, or Anglo Saxon. Uh, both France and, and Poland was, uh, were occupied during the uh, Second World War. Uh, we can also uh, observe some post-war trauma uh, in the um, methodological even uh, choices made by the, some historians in France and in uh, Poland. So some uh, they were trying to uh, put away the facts, the people, the individuals, the wars, yes, uh, the events, great events, and focus themselves to the masses, to the social history, to the long durée um, phenomenon. Uh, so when we um, read uh, the memoirs of some Polish and uh, French historians, we can see the same the same choices. Yes, there was the the, the war, the drama of war. Uh, the big politics, yes. Uh, uh, so we now, after the war, we're trying to put it away, to focus not on the people, not on the events, not kings and queens, yes, and battles, but uh, to the social uh, phenomenon, masses, uh, long durée. Uh, it's also uh, obvious that after 45, the po Polish as a state was turning left, yes, because of the communist rule. But France was also turning left. Um, uh, which is well known, and the communists were the, the most important, uh, one of the most important, yes, political forces uh, just up, um, um, after uh, 45 in uh, France, not only in, in, uh, in, in Poland, with, with when the communist system was somehow imposed. And in France, well, communism was really, really, really attractive for the intellectuals and 
uh, also by um, for the historians. And this, uh, there's uh, my another point: Marxism. Marxism is a very very important tool um, of how to say it, or the instrument uh, or the basis to communicate. Yes, between Polish historians and French ones. The French ones uh, were fascinated by Marxism, an orthodox Marxism, but still Marxism. And Polish historians, well, the most prominent of them, uh, of course, have to use uh, had to use Marxism as a tool because of the political uh, political uh, coincidence, yes, of the political um, force. But they were able to use it un in an orthodox way, so that that this Marxism somehow imposed, but well, still scientifically, intellectually attractive for the French historians. So this unorthodox Marxism was a platform of communication yeah, between, between uh, Polish and French uh, historians. Maybe the causes of this emergence of Marxism are different. Here we got uh, communist rule and here we got uh, intellectual fascination, but still the, 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 the result was, was uh, um, uh, similar. Yes? The, the result was uh, uh, attractive for both sides, let's say it uh, like this. Uh, yeah, and going to my uh, most important uh, important point, the cause of the singularity of contacts is the impact of 1956, as I said. It's quite coincidental impact. Uh, first of all, we got the political liberalization in Poland, yes, in 56, uh, the end of Stalinism, the uh, important uh, liberalization in contrast to the situation in Hungary where, where Soviets are invading. Here we got 56, the liberalization of, uh, of Polish uh, communism under the Władysław Gobulka as a uh, rural. And at the same time, uh, Fernand Brodel uh, became the president um, of the Kol Pratik do uh, He got a big money from uh, from United States for, schol for scholarships, for, uh, for, uh, for giving uh, some uh, money for the scholars. Uh, moreover, just Two years later, the Gaul came to power. Yeah, in '58, uh, Brodel was very Gaullist. Uh, he, he supported. He was supporting the uh, Gaul very, uh, very uh, fiercely, and the uh, the Gaul idea was to make France a kind of uh, uh, mediator between East and the West. So the Gaul and Brodel was interested in uh, developing relations uh, with the East country. With the, with the Eastern countries. At the same time, uh, France was perceived by the communists better than, for example, West Germany, of course, Anglo-Saxon with uh, United States. France was, well, milder, yes? They, they, their uh, position uh, toward communism was not so very critical. So also from the Polish perspective, France was a quite uh, uh, good partner uh, not taking into, into account that it was the, the other side of the uh, Iron Curtain, but still, it was a better partner than the rest Western countries. And for France, the Polish historians, the Pol Poland was better because it was more liberated uh, then than uh, Hungary, of course, East Germany, USSR, and uh, Czechoslovakia, which started its liberation in, uh, in two years' time. Yes, in, uh, in ten years' time, in sixty-seven, eight, not in fifty-six, seven. So, Sorry, pa Patrick, you have uh, two minutes uh, left. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you. we got <laughs> this political, prosopographical uh, um, possibilities uh, and the fact that the two sides were able to communicate. So we got the means of communication, means of contacts, money, political uh, circumstances, uh, yes, the politics, big politics, but also we got people uh, who could... Uh, uh, use this potential, use this opportunity, because uh, this Polish historian speaks, uh, speak, uh, speak, uh, yeah, spoke uh, French. Uh, was interesting. It was using the interesting side of Marxism. Were interested in the same uh, social economic paradigm as we are. We, the French historians, yes. So we got the possibilities and the means to fulfill somehow this potential, and that's the main reason. Uh, coincidental, uh, quite. Uh, lucky conjunction, let's say, of various specific factors, plus the intellectual community yes, uh, between some of the Polish historians and some of the French historians, 
and this equals the singularity, yeah, the singularity of this uh, of these relations. So it's my last must last uh, last statement. I won't even say that it's uh, uh, possible or easy to uh, detect to track the impact of anal school in Poland or less likely Polish impact in the anal school, but um, we could rather argue that despite the Iron Curtain, these two communities, the two uh, milieus, uh, uh, form a one singular intellectual community, yeah, despite the Iron Curtain, which could use the potential created, uh, the potential situation created after 5056. And that's, uh, that's the reason of the singularity of these contacts. That's my last point. Uh, more, uh, more details you can uh, find in my uh, paper. Thank you for your uh, patience. Uh, and yes, that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, so now we, we have the second panelist is uh, Gislaine Potriquet uh, from the University of Strasbourg. Strasbourg. Uh, the title of uh, his paper is uh, in Italian Perché leggere oggi gli storici americanisti della Germania orientale? Of course, uh, in English, uh, you too. <laughs> Please. Thank you very much. Thank you. I uh, somewhat changed the title of my presentation, uh, but the, the, the objective remains the same. The title reads, Is there such a thing as an East German historiography of the United States? Is there such a thing as an East German historiography of the United States? I've uh, chosen on purpose a somewhat tongue-in-cheek title for this presentation because one would assume that there was not. One would assume that there could not have been such a thing, that beyond the Iron Curtain, the United States was too sensitive a topic to be dealt with scientifically, that beyond, beyond the Iron Curtain, diverse interpretations of American history meant dissent, and dissent meant censorship at least. Yet, as historians, we would assume the right answer to uh, this question to be, well, it's complicated and we would be right. Judging from the number of publications printed in GDR in East Germany, one may say that this historiography was scant, was too limited. Um, one, only five books are listed in Werner Röhr's Abwicklung das Ende der Geschichtenwissenschaft der DDR, Rough translation of this title would be Liquidation, the End of History in the GDR. And these books have many things in common. They were all authored by members of the same institution, that's Institut für Allgemeine Geschichte, the Institute for General History, a branch of the East German Academy of Sciences, the Akademie der Wissenschaften der DDR. They were all written uh, about a decade after the official recognition of the GDR by the United States in 1974. So, so these books came out in 1985, 1986. Uh, and they all dealt with the same topic over the same period, the relations between the United States and Europe from 1917 to the late 40s. In other words, a bygone era when the two seemingly antagonistic systems, one capitalist, one Marxist, were able to coexist. Was this corpus indicative of a willingness by the GDR to restore peaceful relations with the West? We will never know because the GDR crumbled soon after. Now, if we expand our corpus, if we expand our definition of historiography, we uh, uh, change it a little bit to encompass, to include all things printed about the United States, we get a different answer. I rely here on Daisy Vessel's study of the United States in East German literature, the title in German reads Bild und Gegenbild die USA in der Belletristik der DDR, Image and Counter Image, the USA in East German Literature. How does this, how does this uh, literary corpus compare to our five or six history books? First, it is much bigger. Although Vessel does not give a specific number for it, she refers to about two dozen works of fictions, uh, two dozen works of fiction, sorry, and two academic journals. Second, the interest of East German scholars of American literature goes back to the mid 50s, when departments of American studies opened in the University of Leipzig, Jena, and Rostock. Another major center of American studies in East Germany was the prestigious Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. Third, although works of fiction naturally deal with a broad, a broad range of topics, East German writers converge to portray American characters in American novels as, and I quote here, I translate directly from Vessel, uh, these characters, these American characters are fundamentally evil. They are cowardly, brutal, 
anti-communist, untrustworthy, lustful, prone to stealing, destructive, and inhuman. In other words, they were capitalists. Now, uh, this uh, uh, highly negative portrayal of American characters became less systematic from the mid uh, 70s onward after the official recognition of uh, um, the GDR by the United States uh, and the restoration of diplomatic relations between the USA and the GDR seem to have diffused East German animosity considerably. So one may be tempted to conclude uh, prematurely uh, that the East German historiography of the United States is too meager, too limited, too, too uniform to be worthy of any scholarly interest. Um, and the chief problem being that of uh, the, uh, the East German historians coerced adherence to a Marxist-Leninist dogma. And that uniformity is, uh, is a fact in a 2017 collective volume entitled East German Historians Since Reunification, Mario Kessler traces the origin to the, the origin of the of history departments by the SED, by the uh, East German uh, Communist Party, to the takeover of that party by Sta Stalinists immediately after the war. Uh, so the party was the Socialist Unity Party of Germany, known in German as the SED, Sozialistische Einheitspartei Deutschland. The SED uh, reach extended over history departments and historical work, historical research. And as Kessler puts it, and I'm quoting Kessler here, the party leadership regarded the purpose of the SED policy on history as being the adaptation of the results of historical research for the legitimization of the given party line. The historians could only accept the convergence of scholarly research and politics when they presented the historical process as being in compliance with a Marxist-Leninist understanding of a programmatic policy directed towards the solution of social problems. The result, still quoting from Kessler here, was, I quote, an impoverished and dualistic worldview, a mindset of good and evil, which pigeonholed the subtle Marxist class analysis into a friend or foe schema. Whoever rejected this way of thinking would inevitably be considered a counter-revolutionary or bourgeois relic. And end quote. So regardless of these uh, political constraints, uh, several contributors to this collective volume uh, edited by Mario Kessler in 2017 noted that there remained in the GDR some space for academic freedom. Georg Igers, a prominent scholar of historiography of uh, East German historiography in particular, notes that although that space existed, it was seldom explored. One, and I'm quoting from Igers here now, one of the sad aspects of the historical profession in the 40 years of the existence of the GDR was the failure of many historians to take advantage of the limited possibilities for free expression that existed. The restrictions that govern the work of the historians do not by themselves explain, Igers ex uh, argue, why new, meth new methods and subject matters, for example, in the study of everyday life and culture of mentalities, which were well established in the West, but also in Poland, in Hungary, and not entirely absent in the Soviet Union, were pursued in the GDR only to a very limited degree. So how did East German historians of the United States of international relations from 1917 to the late 1940s, to be precise, our authors, explore that marginal space for academic freedom? Uh, before proceeding with our question, let us observe with another uh, uh, historian of um, uh, East German historiography, a man called Rainer Schnorr, uh, the author of a chapter entitled A Critical Maneuver, American Studies Caught in a GDR Love Triangle Between Ideological Submission, Scientific Exigence, Exigency, and Popular Interest, that anyone in the GDR writing about the United States found themselves in this peculiar triangular situation indeed. First, the GDR official discourse on the US remained consistently critical. The USA was the center of the reactionary world. Second, East German universities were compelled to offer uh, American uh, history courses of a high standard while remaining in line with the country's official discourse, and that must have been difficult. Third, there was a great amount of interest among the East German public for anything that pertained to the United States, history, its history, its uh, literature, its culture. Because uh, So who were the East German historians of the United States? 
because of time constraints, uh, I can only introduce uh, two of them. The first was Karl Drexler, author of Die USA zwischen Anti-Hitler Koalition und Kalten Krieg, the USA from the forming of the Anti-Hitler Coalition to the beginning of the Cold War. Drexler was born in 1932 in Saxony, only half a dozen miles from the Czech border. He lived through World War II as a child whose father was drafted to serve in the Wehrmacht. He graduated from high school in 1951 and chose to study theology. He quickly switched to history. However, after losing his Christian faith and finding another one in, in Marxism, uh, in other words, uh, Drexler was a firm believer in the political project that was the GDR, and that's something our two historians have in common, and, and many East German historians have in common. They genuinely believed in the objectives of, their, um, of, the, of the GDR as a political project. In 1962, he defended a doctoral dissertation on the foreign relations of the Third Reich with China and Japan, and went on to pursue a successful academic career as a member of uh, the Institute for Geschichte der Deutschen Akademie der Wissenschaften zu Berlin. He was allowed to travel to the United States in 73 and did research at the Library of Congress. Now, our second historian, very quickly, is Peter Schaefer, uh, co author with Rudiger O'Horn of Geschichte der USA 1914-1945, History of the United States from 1914-1945. Similarities between the two men, he was born in uh, Berlin a year before uh, Drexler. He grew up in West Berlin, but moved uh, with his parents in, to East Berlin in 1949. And that was a deliberate choice on the part of his parents. And Schaeffer chose to remain uh, in East Germany. He joined the FDJ, the uh, youth branch of the SCD, and uh, very quickly uh, uh, defended his doctoral dissertation in 1960 and um, uh, went on to teach history at the University of Vienna. So to what extent uh, did our authors, uh, two authors, uh, authors of the USA and Geschichte de the USA use their academic freedom to tackle the critical problem of the unraveling of the anti-Hitler coalition, in other words, the beginning of the Cold War? We'll focus on this episode now because it's one of paramount importance and as such, it lends itself nicely to uh, historiographical comparisons. A first finding, which will not come as a surprise, is that both Schaefer and Drexler remained faithful to the materialist, materialist conception of history. Evidence abounds, the language they use is characteristic of uh, that historiographical, historiographical tradition, sorry. The ruling class, the Herrschende Klasse, das Proletariat, die Bourgeoisie, and these are quite unusual uh, terms in American history books. The second finding, our major finding, is that within this historiography, despite their similitudes, there were differences, there are differences. There is such a thing as an East German historiography of the United States, in other words. Sorry, Gislein, you have two minutes. Okay. You can conclude in two minutes. Okay, okay. just you. the findings and we'll be done. Uh, first, uh, their bibliographies uh, are different. Uh, Drexler uses numerous primary sources and re relatively uh, few secondary sources. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 Schaeffer's uh, uh, bibliography is less orthodox. It includes East German, West German, American sources to an extent that we do not find in uh, Drexler's books. Another striking feature is their near exclusive focus on American domestic politics. Both deal with the history of the United States in the 20th century, at a time when that history was shaped to a large extent by its international environment. Yet they hardly ever discuss the, the dynamics of the US USSR relation. In Drexler, the USA, the USSR is presented as a monolith, a country uh, which foreign policy was consistently guided by the same noble aspiration for world peace. And the USSR and its foreign policy is hardly a topic in these books. They, they seem to evade it, and, and we may uh, you know, talk about the reasons why they uh, avoided carefully discussing the USSR. And my uh, last observation, maybe the most important, uh, the uh, uh, they are in the two books, in the two versions of the same story, heroes and villains. The hero was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He and Stalin had built a relationship based on respect and trust during World War II. The villains surrounded him, however. They were the oligarchs, the members of the ruling class who vowed to quash the USSR for ideological motives. In Schaeffer's Geschichte, they prevailed after the death of uh, FDR. Truman became their puppet, and through him, they were able to push their reactionary capitalist agenda. 
They were a minority, however. Schaefer leads us to understand um, that uh, the Cold War was not uh, meant to be. Uh, conversely, Drexler was pessimistic. As much as he praised FDR, he questioned his ability to rein in the reactionary forces that surrounded him. Drexler considered the end of the anti-Hitler coalition to be inevitable, but within the United States, there existed uh, antagonistic plans for a post-world order. Let me conclude by saying, is there such a thing as an East German historiography of the United States? Yes, there is, but it's complicated because for a long period of time, that topic was too sensitive to be tackled. Such historiography developed in the late 70s and 90s and ended uh, the day the Berlin Wall fell. What is remarkable, however, is that within such a small corpus, within the same materialistic framework, materialist framework, sorry, we find variation. Drexler and Schaeffer did avail themselves of their academic freedom to write different accounts of the beginnings of the Cold War. And as such, I would argue that uh, such authors deserve to be read again in 2021. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oi, Stefano, I, I will introduce you at this point. Thank you very much. So uh, now we will hear uh, Stefano Santoro from the University of uh, Trieste. His paper in Italian is called L'uso della mitologia nazionale nei regimi comunisti dell'Europa orientale. Stefano, you have 15 minutes. I will take the... Uh, thank you, Francesco. <laughs> in the communist regime of uh, Eastern Europe, uh, history and its public use uh, were basically at the service of political power, even if there were episodes of resistance uh, and attempts to carve out spaces uh, for autonomy on the part of some academic and intellectual circles. In the context of the public use of history, great recourse was made to the mytho-symbolic heritage of their, of their respective national histories. This topic is still not particularly studied in Italy, has already been the focus of attention of foreign scholars for several years, some of whom have dedicated themselves in particular to the study of the strange union between Marxism and national myths, or even more explicitly between Marxism and nationalism, with special reference to the communist countries of Eastern Europe. I refer in particular to Martin Mebius and Walter Kemp, who highlighted how Marxism, often used by the radical and revolutionary left between the 19th and 20th centuries to contest the bourgeois nature of the nation, identifying in the advent of socialism, the, the overcoming of all nationalisms, has actually been easily associated with nationalism within the public discourse of those regime. It was therefore an apparent contradiction, which in reality was soon overcome by a clear political interest of parties in power, aware that the national myths deeply rooted in and spread in Eastern Europe, offer the possibility if used in an appropriate way to create consensus around the communist parties, often lacking broad social basis. After the end of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe and the sudden relegation of the communist ideology to a, let's say, mistake in the history of those countries, to a foreign body introduced by force by the USSR against the will of those peoples, a return to the history of, a, of the respective nations began, which led at least in the early years to an often uncritical exaltation of the national past and to a recovery, in some cases apologetic, of discussed characters of the past, linked to the far right and to the collaboration with the Nazi occupier. In reality, as shown by international historiography, more attentive to the phenomenon of the let's say, rediscovery of the nation in post-communist countries, the apologetic and teleological narratives of national histories, and in several cases, a true cult of the nation, have often characterized the public and academic discourse of real socialism. The epoch of real socialism did not therefore represent a denationalizing period, but instead cultivating national history, creating a sort of hybridization between the Marxist form and the content that was often denoted by a close continuity with the national bourgeois narrative codified in the 19th century and perpetuated until the interwar period, which the communist parties had condemned before taking power. 
In short, in keeping with the well-known metaphor of Benedict Anderson, the communists soon understood that in order to have popular legitimacy within often predominantly agrarian realities in which communism and Russia, then the Soviet Union, had the generally inspired aversion rather than sympathy, the cult of the nation was indispensable to obtain popular legitimacy as the new lords of the castle. Indeed, ever since the resistance to the Nazi fascist occupier in the last phase of the Second World War, the communists had resorted to symbols linked to the pantheon of national history in order to present themselves as the true heirs and continuers of traditional patriotism against political opponents who had based their legitimacy precisely on the most radical nationalism. Similarly to, to non-Eastern European realities, such as the Italian one, where the communist partisans had referred to the figure of Garibaldi, so in various countries of Eastern Europe, the nominations belonging to national iconography were recovered. In Hungary, one, one of the divisions in which the volunteers who fought alongside the Soviets against the Nazis were framed from the beginning of 1945, was named after the Hungarian national hero, Lajos Kossuth. Similarly, in Romania, the Communist Party framed the prisoners of war returned from the Soviet Union in the formation Tudor Vladimirescu, also belonging to the Romanian national pantheon, animator together with the Greek fanariot Alexander Ypsilanti of the anti-Ottoman uprising of 1821. The communists, however, while adopting national symbols, were very careful to underline the difference between the so-called bourgeois chauvinist nationalism and their recovery of the national tradition, defined rather as a socialist patriotism. From the beginning, moreover, those who shortly after would have obtained the absolute monopoly of power tried to weld from the ideological point of view the national idea with Marxism. It was therefore no longer a question of a cult of the nation as an end in itself, that is of chauvinism, which continued to be condemned, but of the exaltation of the struggle against oppression dear to Marxism, however declined in a national perspective. On the basis of this ideological framework, the Nazi fascists during the war were fought both as political enemies as class enemies, the imperialist bourgeoisie, and finally as national enemies. In this context, the category of the historical oppressor was widely used. For example, both in an anti-German function, especially but not only by Poles, Czechoslovakians and Yugoslavs, and in an anti-Italian faction by the Yugoslavs. It is worth recalling, for example, that the Czechoslovak Communist Party had accompanied its post-war campaign of expulsion of the Sudeten Germans with historical consideration, which aimed to present it as a sort of national revenge for the defeat of the Bohemian forces in the White Mountain Battle of 1620 by the Habsburgs. The establishment of Soviet control over Eastern Europe in 1948 after the seize of power also in the two countries that had shown signs of greater autonomy, Czechoslovakia and Hungary, required a weakening of social patriotism and a contemporary accentuation of the internationalist dimension of socialism. It was in those years that the accusation of bourgeois nationalism alongside that of Titoism after the Yugoslav Soviet split in June 1948, served to hit those who were seen as potential opponents of Soviet power and of the local communist parties, shaped in the image and likeliness of the Soviet one. As John Connolly explained in his well-known study on the, on, on the Sovietization of the high culture of Eastern European countries, in those years, all university institutes and academies were subjected to a drastic alignment with the directives that in the cultural field and historiography came from the Soviet Union. The death of Stalin and the beginning of the destalinization process and the opening of the new Soviet leadership to the possibility for the various communist parties to undertake national paths to socialism led to a recovery of the respective national mytho-symbolic heritage. 
It was not a homogeneous process, but actually all the communist parties of Eastern Europe were aware that, that the rediscovery and exaltation of their own national histories will strengthen their popular support. Furthermore, each national leadership acted on the basis of its specific characteristics and its own self-legitimation needs. In the Hungary of Kadar, which needed to leave behind the events of October, November, 1956, the recovery of the past was initially more cautious and it was preferred to warn against the reactionary nationalism compared the Hungarian insurgents to the white terror unleashed by Admiral Orti in 1919 against the Republic of Councils of Belakun. However, even in this case, there was no lack of emphasis on the patriotic elements of the 1919 Republic, highlighting how it had defended the Hungarian national territory from the simultaneous attack carried out by the neighboring countries at that time. In reality, the Hungarian regime soon thought it more appropriate not to focus on the revolution of the first post-war period, never particularly loved by the population and uh, after all, not even by the communists themselves, who consider it an episode marked by unsuccessful radicalism, to turn back to their national past with particular emphasis for the revolution of 1848. Romania probably represented the most interesting case of the recovery of national myths. There, in fact, contrary to what happened in other countries of the socialist bloc, 1936 did not lead to a change of leadership and the Romanian regime was able to leverage national sentiment, starting a process of gradual autonomization from the USSR, even though without breaking with Moscow. The absence of reforms was therefore battered in front of the Romanian population with a marked return to national history, the study of which in a mythological and uncritical and comiastic key was encouraged at the academy and university level. If in 1948, the process of cultural Slavicization of the country had been imposed in the sign of a rejection of the West and an integration into the Soviet Eastern sphere, which had led to the denial of the Latin rules of the Romanians between the end of the fifties and the following decade, an inverse process began, which resulted in a rediscovery of Romanian belonging to, to the late in Western cultural universe. In particular, Ceausescu rehabilitated and exalted the work of the bourgeois governments that had led to the creation of Greater Romania, as well as the main symbols of the national narrative, from the heroes of the 1948 revolution to the great exponents of the Romanian culture of the 19th and 20th centuries, previously condemned. The Communist Party was thus featured as the last stage of an uninterrupted path, which started from the ancient nations being represented as the most authentic heir of the Romanian history. If Romania offers one of the most significant examples of national communism, other countries of the socialist bloc of Eastern Europe, in different ways and to different degrees, use national history and mythology in order to strengthen their roots and cement people's consent. In fact, especially starting from the 60s, the communist parties in power presented themselves as the authentic interpreters of the nation's historical mission, gradually emancipating from the necessary limiting role of vanguard of the working class and assuming that of interclass representative of the national community. Historical disciplines and historiographical research were placed at the center of the party's interest and played a key role in the codification of national narratives that could serve as ideological basis for an organic life state in which the collective dimension, cemented by the pride of belonging to a community of people, had to raise all individual and national differences. To this end, Marxist categories were applied in an apparently consequent manner to national history, giving it a social and progressive interpretation to events that had primarily affected the national dimension. In some cases, the actual thinking of Marx and Engels were take, was taken up, for example, in their support for the Hungarian Revolution of 1848-49, seen as a tool to undermine the Habsburg feudal autocracy. In other cases, however, the interpretation of historical events was forced, for example, by qualifying as a revolutionary the Transylvanian peasant uprisings of the late 18th century, or the action of the Romanian nationalists of Transylvania between the 19th and 20th centuries. 
as said at the beginning of this presentation, the end of the communist regimes in 1989 and the discrediting of the communist ideology in the countries of the former socialist camp prompted to fill this political and ideal void through the rediscovery of the nation. Historical studies on the nation and its exaltation as it has been pointed out, it never ceased during the real socialism, except in different ways in the more strictly Stalinist period between the 40s and the 50s. However, once the obligations towards Marxist ideology ceased, national myths could be freed from the social interpretation that historians had usually given to them in homage to the regimes. Between the 90s and the early years of the new century, the histori historiographies of former communist countries often looked at their national history with apologetic and theological accents. Stefano, you have one minute. Yes, yes, I, I conclude. Lead leading to further exasperation, the vision that had already been dictated until the 80s. In the following years, however, the opening, especially of the new generations, new methodologies, such as comparative transnational and entangled history, allowed them to overcome ethnocentric approaches and therefore to address their own mytho-symbolic national heritage with a critical approach. Okay, I finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano. Okay, now uh, Perrine Valle from uh, the University Paris 1 Pantheon Sorbonne will present uh, her paper, La riscrittura cinematografica della storia nella Repubblica Democratica Tedesca. Rappresentazione della resistenza nel cinema della Germania orientale, 1949-1969. Perin, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you, Francesco, and hello, everyone. I would like to share my screen because uh, I am a film historian, so I want to show you some images and film excerpts to illustrate my my talk so i will like so my talk is uh, is focused on the on the gdr cinema and uh, with an analysis of cinematographic representations of the resistance in 1969 the french colonel remy a former resistance fighter known for his right-wing political positions was chosen by the GDR to promote the East German film Die Gefrorenen Blitze in France. The film features a network of European resistance fighters active during World War II. This collaboration between a communist country and a right-wing French colonel seems paradoxical, but can be explained by a shared desire to use cinema and a heroic representation of the resistance to gain visibility and recognition. Indeed, as it was already said, the GDR lacked legitimacy both inside and outside its borders. The SED, the Communist Ruling Party, had no popular legitimacy. The German historian Martin Zabrow formulates the hypothesis of a secondary legitimacy to explain how the East German government reconstituted the past and rewrote German history in order to convince the population of the socialist success. Historiography thus became a discourse of power, a Herrschaftsdiskurs. The cinema played a crucial role in legitimizing the East German regime by bringing historical figures of communism on the, to the screen or by choosing heroes working to build the new socialist German state. World War II, the resistance to fascism and the construction of the GDR were therefore the main topics of the East German filmmakers from the DEFA, the Deutsche Filmaxengesellschaft, the state-owned company that controls the entire production and distribution of cinema in the GDR. In my presentation, I will present several DEFA films produced between 1949, the date of the creation of the GDR, and 1969, the year of the beginning of the host politic uh, led by Willy Brandt. All these films I will speak about depict World War II and the resistance to fascism, and I will show how this cinematographic representation of the resistance is part of the GDR search for legitimacy. During the first decade of the GDR existence, DEFA films set during the Third Reich show exclusively the communist resistance to fascism. 
This is a case of several major films produced between 1949 and 1955. In Rotation, the main character, Hans, is torn between his communist brother-in-law and his son who joined the Hitler Youth. And I show you a short excerpt. Denounced by his own son for having helped his brother-in-law, uh, who is later executed by the Nazi, Hans nevertheless uh, forgives his son at the end of the film. Stärker als die Nacht follows a couple involved in the communist resistance since 1933. The man is arrested and executed again by the Nazi shortly before the arrival of the Soviet troops. And I would like to speak also about Der Teufelskreis, uh, which follows the trial of the communist Georgi Dimitrov, accused by the Nazi of being responsible for the, of the, Reich, for the Reichstag's fire in 1933 and the decline of a fictitious German Social Democrat deputy. While Dimitrov, after passionate speeches, and I will show you uh, one of uh, this speech on communism and an irrefutable demonstration of the duplicity of his Nazi accusers, he's acquitted at the end of the trial. The deputy's hesitations and disengagement drive him to madness and then to die in a concentration camp. And I just show you the final uh, sequence of the movie. In all three films, the resistance fighters are always active members of the Communist Party. It is interesting to observe the evolution of their fate. In the first two movies, their political commitment leads to the death of the communist resistance fighters. But in Der Teufelskreis, on the contrary, Dimitrov uh, represents the triumph of the communists. This time, the tragic fate is reserved for those who hesitate and whose weakness is no longer forgivable. During this first decade, the GDR has to assert its communist identity and distance itself as much as possible from the West Germany. It is therefore also a question of creating a different German identity. The importance of nationality explains the absence of resistance fighters from other countries in the DEFA films. And even when the film take, takes place outside Germany, the German communist resistance fighters are still the heroes. The next film, directed by Karl Balaus, illustrates that. Immediately after Der Teufelskreis, he shot Damals in Paris in 1956. The film takes place in Nazi-occupied France and follows the action of a group of resistance fighters led by a German communist named Georges. Georges is presented as a man of action. In his first screen appearance, he's seen saving one of his injured comrades when they are being chased. He speaks little, but makes decisions and he acts. In contrast, the French resistance uh, fighters, René and Geneviève, are characterized by hesit hesitations and reversal. While the French couple dies at the end of the film, the German hero feels victorious since the action against the Nazi was successful despite the death of the others. Moreover, the film, the film comes out just after the hagiography devoted to Ernst Thälmann, uh, the former leader of the German Communist Party, who was murdered by the Nazi during World War II. 
and played by the same actor, Gunther Simon, who was playing Georges in Damals in Paris. For East German viewers, the closeness between the communist leader and the resistance fighter could not have been expressed more explicitly. At the end of the first decade of the GDR existence and after the thaw, the cinematographic representation of the resistance evolves. The film um, Sterne, directed by Konrad Wolf, offers a more nuanced and more complex vision of the resistance, significantly less focused on German nationality and communist commitment. Above all, Stern is the first post-war German film to feature the deportation of European Jews during World War II. The film is co-produced with Bulgaria and tells the story of Walter, a, a German sub-officer in charge of guarding a transit camp in Bulgaria, and Ruth, a Greek school teacher who is part of the convoy of Jewish deportees on their way to an extermination camp in Poland. As he falls in love with Ruth, Walter becomes aware of the atrocity of Nazism and of his individual responsibility. Also, he cannot save her. He decides to join the Bulgarian resistance at the end of the film. Also brief, this presence of a resistance movement other than an exclusively German one is all the more important as the film was awarded at the Cannes International Film Festival. The sharp presence of a non-German resistance movement in Sterne and the positive echoes of the film in France foreshadow the successful screening of another DEFA production on the resistance at Cannes 10 years later. Based on real events, Die Gefrorenen Blitzen traces the actions of German, Polish, and French resistance groups during World War II. The promotion of the film abroad highlights the multinational dimension of the resistance network. The film's characters are numerous and spread over several continents in Europe, but also Africa and the United States. As in Sterne, we first follow a German character, the engineer Grunwald, who starts collaborating with the Nazi before joining the resistance. Even though his journey serves as a thread in the plot, the German resistance fighters appear isolated and powerless against the Nazi. Heroism is more embodied by the Poles and by the French. The actions of the, two, of the latter two resistance uh, groups are presented as complementary, albeit with deeply divergent implications. On the one hand, French characters are represented through several stereotypes that give them a sympathetic face, but at the detriment of a real commitment to seriousness. On the other hand, the Poles are portrayed in, in a way that is more in line with the representation of socialist heroes, meaning that they are ready to sacrifice themselves for, the, for their cause. The Polish resistance is embodied by the character of Stefan, also, he's accompanied by other Poles on his missions. He's the only one to survive all the dangers they encounter. He stands out as the man of action, unaware of the danger and ready for any challenge. The French resistance fighters, on the other hand, define themselves as a group. In opposition to Stefan, we hardly know their names. And while Stefan, Stefan is constantly on the move, the French resistance fighters are often unmoving and protected in closed and comfortable places. The film thus implicitly minimizes the French group's tendency to act and to take risks. Despite this difference, Die Gefrorenen Blitze is a singular moment in the history of the DEFA. Despite the limits, the particular inclusion of the French in the resistance to fascism is evidence of an attempt to open up to the West, or at least to France. The cinematographic representation of the resistance movements in these DEFA films reflect first of all the tension surrounding East German identity and the search for legitimacy undertaken by the GDR. But the but the heroization of the resistance figures is not only specific to East Germany. In France, in the immediate post-war period, the Gaullists and the Communists also try to appropriate the heritage of the resistance. Sylvie Lindeberg shows, for example, 
how French films produced after 1945 contributed to shaping the myth of an entirely resistant country. Nevertheless, the question of nationality is particularly important in the DEFA cinema, as the GDR is fully defined in opposition to West Germany. Foreign or non-communist characters, therefore, had no place in the resistance in the films produced during the 50s. When the Cold War became less warm at the end of the 50s, DEFA filmmakers were able to create more complex characters struggling with doubts and hesitations, as Konrad Wolf did in Sterne. Die Gefrorenen Blitze, produced six years after the construction of the Berlin Wall, raises new issues. The Iron Curtain seems to have so firmly anchored the borders of the GDR that the country feels ready to, to turn to the West. Also, the French resistance fighters do not behave as heroically as the socialist poles. Their active presence in the plot is truly noteworthy. The portrayal of the uh, French uh, resistance fighters even has a paradoxical effect. It encourages the French distributors to present the film at the Cannes Film Festival, arguing that the story of the European network was part of the history of the French resistance, but it also relegates the East German origin of the film to the background. Rin, you have one minute. Okay. The European dimension of the resistance enabled higher visibility of GDR cinema outside its national borders, as much as it contributed to the lack of recognition of the GDR's communist identity. After welcoming the positive reception of Die and Blitze in France, East German officials became concerned about the way French distributors were using the film to promote the French resistance fighters' own involvement to the detriment of the German communist resistance. As if in reaction to this, the DEFA produced shortly afterward another film about the collective action of a resistance group. This time, the film entitled KLK and PTX Die Rote Kapelle focused again on exclusively, exclusively German resistance heroes. Thank you for your attention, and I leave the floor to my colleagues. Okay, thank you, Parin. So now it's the turn of uh, Francesco, Francesco Davanti, uh, Southern Town University. Uh, the title of his uh, presentation is in, in Italian, <laughs> Alla ricerca di un mutuo vantaggio, i contatti tra comunisti italiani e romeni in ambito storiografico, 1967-1983. So please, Francesco. Thank you very much, Stefano. So the paper uh, that I have submitted in Italian is a revised version of a research article published in 2016 on the journal History of Communism in Europe. The paper focuses on the contacts between uh, communist parties in the domain of culture, and more specifically in the history domain during the Cold War. Specifically, the case study focuses on the contacts between the Italian and the Romanian communists between the 60s and the 70s. The research question is, uh, which advantages did the international contacts across the Iron Curtain provide to its participants? This is an entangled history which gives centrality to the division of Europe. It wishes to focus not much on the limitations that the Cold War imposed, but on the opportunities that it offered selectively to the various organizations and individuals uh, on both sides of the Iron Curtain to achieve their own goals. The paper is inspired by the research by Michael David Fox and Georgi Petteri on the osmotic tendencies of the Iron Curtain, which would have favored the globalization of knowledge. The protagonists of these entanglements are the communist parties, which since 1956 were attempting to redefine their international relations. After the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the dismantlement of the common form, the centrifugal and autonomous tendencies of the Communist Party obliged Nikita Khrushchev to open to the democratic and national road to socialism, respectively, in Western and Eastern Europe. However, Khrushchev did not uh, accept any compromise on the ideological leading role of the Soviet Union for world communism. The attempts of the Communist parties to redefine their international relations without renouncing to Soviet orthodoxy made their ideological positions schizophrenic and uncertain. 
the 20th Congress had actually generated several dramatic changes inside the Communist parties for what regards the Italian and the Romanian Communist parties in particular. In the Italian Communist Party, the internal dissents, the purist of Stalinism, but also the supporter of the revolution in Italy had been marginalized. And they had started to focus on the past glories of the Italian resistance. They started so to deal with history. But in the late 1960s, the democratic centralism of the Western Communist Party was not uh, able anymore to deal with the internal dissent. On the eve of the entanglement that I will present, the intellectuals of uh, the newspaper Il Manifesto were expelled from the Italian Communist Party for having criticized the East European countries, which they define as normalized rightist deviation. In Eastern Europe, the 20th Congress had produced much different results than in Western Europe, in particular in Romania, the case at the time looking at one of the two extremes of the entanglements I'm looking at. While in Romania, the party secretary, Gheorghe Gheorghe Udeje, had annihilated uh, his opponents already in the mid-50s, so he ruled and disputed. However, he was convinced that the destalinization would have meant a danger to his leadership. For saving uh, his, uh, his own leadership, uh, he enacted a reaction to the de destalinization, which consisted in showing loyalty to Moscow, but also in reviving the national discourse as an attempt to raise domestic loyalty towards the party and in conserving the Stalinist power structure. And he succeeded in doing so. The external observers started to understand this grand strategy only in the mid 60s. His successor, Nicolae Ceausescu, capitalized on the strategy since 1968, once he expressed his dissent against the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia among domestic and Western applauses. In the years under focus, the Italian Communist Party and the Romanian Communist Party were by then redefining their relationship, which was characterized by their mutual perception as equal actors. The Romanian protagonists of these events were the staff of the Institute of Historical and Sociopolitical Studies, established in 1951 with the name of Party History Institute, which was uh, and continued to remain until 1989 a section of the Central Committee of the Romanian Communist Party. What was it? it, was a, it this institute was a propaganda institute aimed at producing historical studies. Following the party line in the 60s, the institute uh, had withdrawn from collaborating uh, with other similar institutions uh, of the East European Communist Parties and of the Communist Parties in general, but it favored instead the establishing of relationships with cultural networks and research institutions in Western Europe. The Institute's historian took part in two conferences, also in Italy, already in the early 60s, among whom the one organized in Milan by Enzo Collotti on the history of the Second World War which Colotti had ideated as a bridge between Eastern and Western uh, Europe and East and West European historians. By studying the archive of, the, uh, of this Romanian institute, uh, ISISP, it is uh, possible to understand that the contacts with uh, the Italian network of the National Institute for the History of the Liberation Movement in Italy were kept by the constant, continuative, and massive shipping of the historiographical products edited and published by the Institute. And this went from 1967 to 1989. Now, from uh, 1969, the relationship uh, under focus, the cultural relationship between the Romanian and the Italian Communist Party became more dynamic and less formal, thanks to the entanglements between historians, cultural managers, and publishers, with which visited each other and signed public various publishing contracts. Those contacts began on Franco Ferri, director of the Granchi Institute in Rome, who was invited in Romania. Ferri had been uh, uh, only one of the many foreigners that the, uh, the Romanian Institute invited regularly for establishing itself in the international cultural networks. Ion Popescu Puzzuri, director of the Institute, invited Ferri and his colleague to take part to two conferences in Romania. And Ferri returned the courtesy inviting the Romanian historians to conferences organized by the Gramsci Institute in Rome. And he also invited uh, the Institute to send a Romanian historian to Rome for a, a research visit. 
Kutsuri accepted the invitation to send Romanian historian to Rome, but he was more cautious in accepting the invitation to public conference. First, he needed with discretion to understand what was the finality uh, of the conferences. He did not know if the conference would be in line with the politics of the Romanian regime, and he could not risk uh, that they weren't. But in the meantime, uh, he, he, sent, uh, he sent Maria Covaci, an historian of the Romanian Institute, uh, in Rome in 1970. Filippo Frassati, vice director of the Gramsci Institute, functioned as a host and confident in Rome. The report uh, ended in from Covaci to return in Romania is very much telling about the division and competition existing in the cultural network surrounding the Italian Communist Party and on the competition for establishing privileged international relations by its networks. For guaranteeing exclusive contact with the Romanian guests, Frassati explained that the Italian Communist Party was shaken by anti-Soviet position and by those who criticized explicitly the East European countries. He warned Kovaci uh, of the Philo Maoist present in Il Manifesto and, and at the Feltrinelli Institute in Milan. Despite Kovaci wished to visit Milan, specifically for visiting the Feltrinelli Institute, Frassati made an alternative proposal that she could not refuse as an historian. He filled her agenda with meetings with all the most important authorities in the historiographical and archival domains in Rome. How could she say no? Her excitement resulted very clearly from her report. So until then, the setting of this uh, Italo-Romanian entanglement were uh, Rome and Bucharest. But the, this story continued. Frassati was successively invited to Romania since the regime wanted to keep uh, uh, close contact with him. He was a precious collaborator who had enlightened the, the Romanian regime, or at least the Institute, the Romanian Institute, on the internal division of the Italian cultural left. Confidentially, Puturi uh, had asked Frassati which kind of conference were then those famous one, those famous conferences that ferried the year before had invited the, the Romanian historians to take part in too. And Frassati quite kindly admitted that the Romanian regime suffered of a well-established image at the Gramsci Institute. He explained that the Gramsci Institute had ideated the establishing of a center for the study for the East European uh, Socialist countries, which effectively started its activities in 1971, so the year after. The Gramsci Institute had no specific know-how of Romania, so the best expert that uh, Ferry and the, and the other uh, organizer of the center could come up with was Giuseppe Botta, journalist of Lunita, who had recently visited Romania and interviewed Ceausescu. And Botta was very frank. He had visited, in his own word, the South American dictatorship where the cult of the leader reigned supreme. Romania could be, at best, he said, an interesting case study for its exasperated nationalism. Probably because of this whistleblowing, the center could not find any referent in Romania, and certainly not the Romanian Institute. Frassati reconfirmed himself as the best man of the Institute in Italy, and in this quality, he helped the Romanian cameras to publish their products. In 1971, he hosted once again Kovaci and uh, favored her uh, contacts with the Italian publisher for finally translating uh, in Italian the best works of Romanian historiography. They both met Roberto Bonchio, director of Editorial Unity Publishing, and agreed on the publishing of The History of the Romanian People by Andrea Ozzetia, who was the director of the Orga Institute. The entanglement expanded geographically and at network level in this second trip to Milan, where they met Nicola Teti, mastermind of Nicola Teti Publishing and owner of the leftist monthly Il Carendario del Popolo. Kovac and Teti agreed for publishing the volume Romania in the anti hitlerist War and to edit an entire issue of Il Calendario del Popolo with Romania as a subject, with the help of the Romanian historians. Kovaci had been invested by, by the director of her own institute of the power to deal directly with uh, the Italian publishers. The Romanian regime paid for all the translation. It bought sufficient copies for covering all the publisher expenses and in the deal with Teti to pay a pre-established sum for the monographic issue. Basically, the Italian publisher were obliged only to enroll famous Italian intellectuals and politicians and to convince them to write introduction to their volumes. The extraordinary entrepreneurship of Deti created a much profitable occasion for the mutual advantage uh, uh, for his own finances and also for the Romanian regime. Already before Kovaci sat at his uh, office, he had studied the Romanian regime. 
that he had understood very well that the cult of the leader was fed by the leader itself. And he knew that uh, the Romanian comrades would not refuse to set up such an important occasion for giving international visibility to their leader. Therefore, after closing the deal for the volume and the issue, he explained to Kovacs his vision, having the writings of Ceausescu published in Italian. And he had it uh, his target fully. He was invited in Romania by Ceausescu in person. This publishing agreement were finalized in 1971 and 1972 on the eve of the signature of the protocol of exchange and cooperation between the two communist parties. Francesco, sorry, you heard two minutes. Thank you yeah. very much, Stefano. Okay. The writing of Ceausescu were uh, introduced in the Italian version uh, by the Italian Communist Party secretary Luigi Longo for the volume published by the Tori Riuniti and by Carlo Serinari, director of Il Calendario. So in this case study, the transnational dimension had succeeded in conciliating the interest of different professions and institutions. Also in the domain of history and of propaganda, the Iron Curtain allowed to establish form of cooperation which brought to a mutual advantage to its, to its participants. To conclude, other publishers, Italian and Europeans, more or less gravitating around the orbit of the communist parties or of the left more in general, would have visited Romania and taken similar publishing agreements in order to spread the regime, cultural and propaganda production, and to realize an economic profit. After the Conference of Helsinki, with the centrality of the human right in the international public opinion and in the civil society's agenda, the Romanian and the Italian Communist Party gradually move away from each other. The Italian Communists started to express more and more openly and clearly to the Soviet comrades the importance that they attributed to democracy and pluralism while Romania continued to stress incessantly the principle of non-interference in internal politics by international actors. By the beginning of the 80s, the relationship was non-existing. Therefore, the strange Italian world record for a number of volumes of Ceausescu's writing and apologetic writings of the Romanian regime is the product of a very specific epoch, which started in the phase of the so-called normalization of the East European communist dictatorship and from the progressive and constant distancing of the Western Communist Party from Moscow until, as a last uh, temporal point, the Conference of Helsinki changed the international context. Some publisher and Italian politicians and industrialists who were not close uh, or affiliated to the Italian Communist Party, like uh, the industrialists and the Romanian uh, Italian industrialist Josef Constantin Dragan, contributed uh, to that bizarre Guinness uh, record as well, of course. However, since the beginning of the 80s, the international image of the Romanian regime was so irremediably compromised that even those few cultural exchanges were then put uh, to an end. My presentation is finished. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Francesco. So now I think we can start the last uh, part of the, the panel. So I call Stefano Bottoni for the, for the final discussion. Okay, please, Stefano. Thank you very much, Stefano, and uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, uh, it is a very exciting panel, uh, and I regret then that uh, uh, we have very little time, uh, not only for my remarks, which are not so interesting, but for the general discussion. Stefano Santoro, how many minutes I have? Was it 1548? I, I can't hear you. You are muted, sorry. You have more or less uh, 15 minutes. 15? Okay. 15, wow. 15. Wow, okay. Okay. I, I thought five, so I... <laughs> I feel so rich. Okay. Anyway, uh, I, I wouldn't like to spend all of them. I, I, will, I will try to, uh, to remain uh, uh, within 10, 12 minutes. Uh, and I, of course, I can't uh, uh, engage uh, in uh, uh, commenting in detail uh, all these very interesting papers because uh, you have touched upon uh, many different uh, countries and topics. Uh, I'm generally not an expert in, uh, as probably as, as uh, some of you might know, I'm an expert uh, of Romania and Hungary. So I, I know very little about GDR, quite a little about Poland. So I, I wouldn't like to, to engage in this field, but uh, reading these papers and listening to your presentations, uh, uh, I was uh, constantly reminded of how true, how much true, uh, 
is the perception we have in the most recent historiography of the fact that on the one side, Iron Curtain was really a semi-permeable membrane, uh, as Michael David Fox uh, uh, has said. So not something fixed, not something absolute, but uh, a divisory line which could be overcome from time to time, uh, selectively, uh, partially, uh, at the discretion of local or central authorities, uh, uh, depending on the change of ideological wing, winds uh, uh, in a certain country, in a certain phase, but it was not absolute. The second thing is the plurality of approaches uh, uh, and uh, the very early re-emergence of national histories. From this point of view, uh, we see uh, how difficult it is now to, uh, to, uh, uh, to claim that national history, national path only reemerged after the end of the communist regimes in 1989, 1990. Uh, we see plenty of proofs, plenty of examples of how much national paths, how much national histories, and I'm speaking here not about history at singular, but different histories and visions, approaches, and interpretations of history started to emerge. Uh, already uh, during the communist regime in the 1950s, in the 1960s. Uh, uh, from this point of view, the case of the GDR uh, is remarkable because we are not inclined to think about the GDR in terms of plurality of approaches uh, and of, of national path. So the standard approach on the GDR was well, the GDR was the most ideologically committed internationalist uh, uh, state, of course, second Germany, alternative German identity, but uh, uh, according to standard accounts, this, uh, uh, this uh, for example, the, 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 uh, the claim for German traditional virtues like militarism only emerge in the public sphere starting from the 1970s. What we see here uh, uh, in, the, in the paper, in, in your papers dedicated to the GDR, is the fact that starting from the 1950s, uh, authorities and intellectuals realize the necessity of starting, the, uh, starting a debate. The problem here is the very difficult position of the GDR. From this point of view, the GDR was a very special state, a very special case uh, uh, within the socialist camp, and uh, they could never really overcome uh, the rigidity uh, of, of, of the model. Uh, it is remarkable that, for example, even in the USSR, for example, in the Academy of Sciences, uh, one of the most exciting places to, uh, to work in was the Institute of World Economy, the Institute for, for US and Canadian Studies. Uh, of course, uh, half of the staff uh, was uh, uh, trained and employed by the KGB as well. So they were, in many cases, uh, they were uh, intelligence officers, but they could be intelligence officers working in the Academy of Science because they had access to relevant literature, which was a, was a, was a key problem. Uh, and in the GDR, the, U, the US, the US, the USA uh, doesn't seem to be so important. Uh, of course, they were studying another much closer enemy, West Germany. Uh, and I'm sure they had uh, much better access to everything uh, 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 was produced, intellectually speaking. Uh, in West Germany and by West Germany uh, uh, than, uh, than about the US. And this is why probably they could stick to a very uh, ideologically uh, uh, narrow-minded uh, vision of the US as, in, as, as imperialist uh, power with some exception, for example, the war, war period in which uh, uh, GDR historians try uh, to find a bridge between East and West. So if, as an, if uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt would be allowed 
uh, to continue the, uh, the great anti-fascist alliance with the USSR. Uh, we could have a you know, very different story, but unfortunately, reactionary forces prevail in the, in the US. So uh, we got a different story. Uh, the other interesting stuff here, uh, very common to is uh, personal connections. Uh, historians are human beings and human relationships develop through personal contacts. And uh, these personal contacts I see from your paper could be very accidental. Someone traveling to Paris, meeting someone, getting an invitation for a conference, seminar, getting a scholarship. Uh, you know, uh, this world in the 1940s, 1950s, which was, was really narrow, was not so bureaucratized like now. It was not like applying for an ERC uh, or a Horizon Europe grant. It, it could be very, very simple, a French professor inviting you or giving you money to do something or just opening, the, opening up a lot of opportunities. You spent a couple of months in Paris and got to know all the important people there. And these contacts, could influence your professional life uh, forever because you could become in Poland, in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia, the expert of or the personal friend of the big French, British, somewhat professor. Uh, so the French connection uh, for the, in the Polish case is very interesting. I knew something about it. Uh, I could add that there was a French connection, for example, in, in the philo in philosophy or sociology or architecture as well. So the whole uh, Polish uh, intellectual environment starting from the 1920s, 30s was deeply influenced by the French professional experience and historians uh, 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 made no exception. And the impact of the Annal School was really remarkable. In the case of Hungary, uh, uh, Gislen, I think uh, you, uh, no, sorry, Patrick, you, 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 you mentioned, you mentioned uh, this. So the case that uh, also uh, a number of Hungarian historians were influenced by France and by the Annal is absolutely true. If, you th if, if we think about famous people like uh, Janusz Such, who published a very influential uh, work about uh, about the central, re central region of uh, Europe, which was published in French as well in the 1980s. Uh, uh, Brodel uh, considered, for example, Jan Such as one of the absolute best uh, uh, medieval historians in, uh, in Europe. For the Hungarians, it was less easy because uh, uh, starting from Trianon and starting from the early 19th century, uh, the official relationship with the two countries were not so friendly. So for, in the, in the, in the, for the Polish intellectual field, uh, France was a natural reference point. In the case of Hungary, the reference point had been Austria and the Habsburg Empire. If I could, uh, if we would like to develop this panel uh, geographically, uh, in the case of Hungary, I would say we should explore the Vienna connection. So the fact that Stefano, your Hello. mic is off. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. It's, it's, it's been one second. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, in the case of Hungary, for example, uh, it was uh, nor Paris nor London, but these Hungarian historians uh, who were partly, uh, in some cases, of Schwab uh, descent, for example, Ferenc Glotz, they very simply spoke uh, Viennese. Uh, German. They, they spent time in, in, in Vienna, they had a lot of friends there, they became friends uh, with, the, with, the, with the bosses, with the chiefs of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. In the 1960s, they started to organize conferences and seminars together, and which was the common topic, because they had a common topic and a common issue, it was the positive re-evaluation re re of the Habsburg Empire. And here I come to the third and last point of my small remarks. I think that uh, it would be very fascinating to develop this panel uh, on a reflection on the, on the nexus between multinational empires 
and uh, the professional memory, historical memory of multinational empires in the communist historiographies and colonialism and decolonization. In some cases, for example, in the case of Romania, the problem was, okay, they are part of an empire with some maverick steps. And that at the same time, they have to decolonize their own history, uh, trying to get rid of several empires, the Turks, the Hungarians, the Germans, everyone, to build up the true national canon. Uh, in other cases, in other historiographies, the Hungarian, for example, maybe the Pole one, because the, Pole, the Poles also had an empire in the 15th, 16th century, uh, they were very proud of. Uh, the problem is imperial legacy. What to do with imperial legacy while the, you are part of an empire, the Soviet empire, the Soviet bloc? So I think that uh, something similar started, some similar discussions started uh, at a historical level in Eastern Europe in the 1960s, 70s on the multinational empires, like uh, in the West, like in Paris, like in London, like in the US uh, uh, on the colonial experience. There was very scarce examples of uh, autochthonous colonial experience in Eastern Europe. There were no colonial powers, but they, they had the past to cope with. The, the Habsburg monarchy, the, the, the Ottoman Empire, Tsarist Russia. So th there was plenty, plenty to discuss about and all the discussions implied a deep reevaluation of the essence of national consciousness. What is the essence, essence of Polish national consciousness? It is, a, it, is a, it is a large idea of we have been at some point a large empire uh, uh, making up half of, half of Eastern Europe, or we are the Polish ethnic community. The same was for Hungary. Are we supposed to, to, to speak for 10 million Hungarians now? Or are we supposed to speak as a former empire comprising half of the Balkans. And I think that, I think that communist historiography could never really uh, uh, solve this internal contradiction, but they were very much aware of it. They tried uh, to, to, um, uh, to elaborate on, and I think that all these problems also tell us uh, how plural were these approaches compared to the fact that party, the ideological section of the party, the propaganda section of the party, all of these party apparatus had a very strict agenda theoretically to impose uh, uh, to historians. So I think that uh, historians had a path. And uh, if we uh, try now to study their production so many years after, uh, the collapse of communism, I think that we can uh, really reevaluate them much more positively. We can discover how difficult it was for them, not just to get a scholarship, but to get rid of a, of a set of, of, of uh, mental constrictions and uh, to try to develop a more open, uh, a more open uh, mentality. So, they had to build national history while trying to build transnational networks, which is a very uh, tricky uh, task uh, if you think in these terms. So uh, thank you very much for these papers. And uh, uh, I think that uh, it would be not really nice to develop them uh, into a shared publication or into something even more comprehensive because you have wonderful uh, primary sources and, uh, and a very good uh, uh, starting point uh, for a good uh, historiographical discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. So I think uh, we have to, to finish, to close our panel here because uh, yes, perhaps one more minute, but <laughs> I think uh, Marco, what do, you, what do you say? 
Yeah, I mean, 60 seconds. Yes, we do. Okay. Seconds <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you all for for being with, with us. And uh, thank you to, to Marco, to our discussions, to Stefano Bottoni, of course. And uh, so see you, see you soon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank thank you, you very much. Thank you, Stefano. Bye. Thank, nice you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.